We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad. On the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Melvin and Howard on September 19th, 1980. It was written by Bo Goldman, directed by Jonathan Demme, and released by Universal Pictures. In December of 1967, Utah man Melvin Earl Dumar claimed to have discovered reclusive business tycoon Howard Hughes disheveled on the shoulder of U.S. Route 95, about 150 miles north of Las Vegas. Hughes allegedly asked for a ride to the Sands Hotel and didn't introduce himself until just before leaving the car. Nine years later, when Hughes passed away, a handwritten will was discovered in the headquarters of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Salt Lake City, Utah. Rife with misspellings and bizarre mistakes, the will called for $156 million to be donated to the LDS Church and a sixteenth of the billionaire's fortune was left to one Melvin Dumar. Among the mistakes in the will were naming the executor Noah Dietrich, who had left Hughes' employ on bad terms 17 years earlier, before the alleged encounter with Dumar. The will left fortunes to two of Hughes' ex-wives, whose alimony agreements strictly forbid them from making any inheritance claim in the event of his passing. And the will also referred to the Hughes H4 Hercules as the Spruce Goose, a derisive nickname that Hughes had always despised. Dumar took the estate to court multiple times starting in 1978, resulting in a series of court battles that all ended in rulings against Dumar. Jeff Schumacher, the author of Howard Hughes' Power Paranoia and Palace Intrigue, 2008, said in a phone interview that there had been no logical reason for Hughes to be in the desert without his usual coterie of aides. But I disagree, Hughes did a lot of weird things, often by himself. Before we start, I wanted to share an email I got from my mom's late uncle, Joe Murphy, about a decade ago. He was basically on his deathbed, and he would send out long emails about the most fascinating moments from his life, and this one always stuck with me, so I saved it. This is an email from my mother's uncle, Joe Murphy. One night in 1950, another guy and I were working the swing shift with the California Air National Guard in Van Nuys, and about 3 a.m., here comes the first jet airplane built, the Avro-1 built in Canada, and pulled up into our area, which was secure climbed down the stairs and wanted to know if he could park it overnight. Hell, we did not even know who he was, so we called our boss at the time and said some guy by the name of Howard Hughes just parked his jet transport in our area and wants to know if it's okay. Our boss did and said hell yes and anything else he wants. At first, he thought we were both drunk. So Howard Hughes came into our little night guard shack, asked us to use our phone and did, and called somebody and said, I'm at the National Guard shack in Van Nuys and hung up and sat and talked to us for about an hour. Then a caravan of about 15 cars pulled in, he thanked us, and left. Peg about went nuts when I told her about it the next day. She thought we had both been drinking too. Lol. <laughs> Peg was my grandmother, his sister. Yeah, I also love that Joe said lol, though. Yeah. <laughs> Employees of Hughes at the time have, in the ensuing years, provided testimony that they do recall Mr. Hughes being dropped off by Mr. Dumar, but that doesn't prove the authenticity of the will. This film was originally titled The Melvin Dumar Story, which I actually like better mm -hmm. because it's not about his relationship with Howard. Yeah. Mike Nichols was the original choice to direct. Jack Nicholson was offered the role of Melvin first and passed, though he did recommend the script to friend and occasional co-star Mary Steenburgen. Mike Nichols abandoned the project when Jack Nicholson turned the project down. Jason Robards was the third actor at the time to portray Howard Hughes after Tommy Lee Jones and Victor Holchak in 1977. I'm curious what Tommy Lee Jones uh, portrayed him in. Yeah. I don't, in, know, I don't know who that other actor is. Victor Holchak? Yeah, yeah, I'm not familiar. In 1980, the closest we've gotten was Howard Huge from the <laughs> sketch that opened the interminable Loose Shoes. <laughs> Howard Hughes' middle name was actually Robard, though. Uh, let's see. Tommy Lee Jones was in a TV movie called The Amazing Howard Hughes. Oh, there you go. Hmm. The film was shot largely where the actual events took place, including shooting the courtroom scene in the exact courtroom where the original trial was held. That's interesting because it's a, it's a weird looking little courtroom. Yeah. So I felt like it had to be authentic when I was watching it because I'm like, why would you... Very strange shape. Why would you design this to shoot it? <laughs> yeah. 
This film is considered by some to be the first film in the biopic subgenre referred to as BOSUD, which is an acronym for Biopic of Someone Undeserving, a subgenre largely populated by the works of Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski, having written Ed Wood, The People vs. Larry Flint, Man on the Moon, and Autofocus. Whoever chose these films in particular would probably also have included My Name is Dolomite on that list, but I personally disagree with most of these, that they're undeserved biopics. Well, I think it depends on what you're doing with it. Because yeah. I think if you glorify somebody who maybe shouldn't be glorified, I get mm-hmm. I get that. And so if you're changing the story, right. that's a problem. But if you're representing the story of somebody who's interesting, whether they're good or not, I think that's totally acceptable. Yeah. yeah. I mean, let's look at uh, Can You Ever Forgive Me? That just came out. Right. Well, it didn't just come out. It came out two years ago. But that's a story about a person who is forging all kinds of letters from famous people to make money. And yeah. it's a really tragic story. Um, but I wouldn't say that this is a person that I would look up to or right. yeah. is is deserving of, uh, you know, a notch on history. Yeah. This film inspired an SCTV sketch called Melvin and Howard's, wherein Rick Moranis as Dumar picks up Joe Flaherty as Howard Hughes and then Eugene Levy as Howard Cosell and then Dave Thomas as Congressman Howard Baker, and finally John Candy as Curly Howard. (laughs) Melvin and Howard's, Thursday at 9 on SCTV. Also coming, Noel Coward and Melvin Dumar in Melvin and Coward, and then Susan Hayward and Melvin Dumar in Melvin and Hayward. Be there Thursday at 9. Melvin and Howard won the National Society of Film Critics Award for Best Film in 1980. What? Screenwriter Bo Goldman took home the Oscar for Best Original Screenplay for this film. This film won an Oscar? It won multiple Oscars. What? Yeah. For her performance in the film, Mary Steenburgen was awarded the Oscar and Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actress. Robards was nominated for the Supporting Oscar and Golden Globe as well, but took home neither. I love Jason Robards, but that nomination makes no sense to me. He has almost nothing oh to do God. in this film and he's only in the first 20 minutes. I well, he's he's got a doesn't doesn't he have a flashback at the end? Yeah, but he doesn't do anything more. Yeah, no, it. no, yeah. no, it's the same as the stuff that was shot at the beginning, well, but I'll, you know, sometimes I wonder for these award shows when when an actor is considered aged and they're like Oh, he he did this really small part. We should try to get him an Oscar. Yeah. yeah. Um. And but it's crazy because he was still working. Like he was in Magnolia in yeah, '99. He, yeah. He, he was say, I was just gonna say he went on for another twenty years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. I'm so glad that we're gonna redo our Oscars at the end of this yeah. because this is not what I would have nominated. I think that this was probably an obligatory nomination because Robards in the previous three years in '77 and '78 he got the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. So it was just kind of like a, oh, he's an Oscar person, so we'll throw his name in and no one can complain about it. Yeah. Even though this is not the performance that warranted that. But he won an Oscar for All the President's Men and Julia. I mean, I'm going to say there's, there's nothing wrong with his performance in this movie. Right. This This movie is unremarkable. Yes. Although, weirdly, director Paul Thomas Anderson considers this one of his favorites and obviously had the honor of directing Jason Robard's final feature film performance as Earl Partridge in Magnolia. We open with a pond in the desert. Handwritten opening titles over Wilderness remind me of our last Art Linson production, Where the Buffalo Roam, which was also with DP Tak Fujimoto. An older guy is by himself jumping a motorcycle in the dunes. A title tells us this is somewhere outside Tonopah, Nevada. The biker crashes off a jump and collapses in the dirt. I was getting serious Cable Hogue flashbacks. Yes, yes. for sure. Like, he's like, oh, he's driving around Cable Springs. Yeah, <laughs> it's basically the same place. It's like just outside Las Vegas in Nevada Yeah, in the desert. We cut two hours later in a headlight POV on a dark road. Someone is switching between radio stations for a while before killing the music and singing an awful Christmas song to himself. The driver, Melvin Dumar, pulls over to take a piss off the road, and as he swings his headlights around to get back on the highway, he notices the older man collapsed in the dirt. Melvin lifts the man onto his feet and carries him to the truck. Melvin offers to take the man into town to the hospital but his passenger is not interested in doctors or nurses. He's super aggressive with him, too. When he finds him laying on the ground, he's, like, like hitting he throws him. throws like, him into the car. He's like, hey, hey, what are you doing? What yeah. are you doing? It's just like, whoa, give the guy a break. Yeah. Like, you don't know who he is or what he's doing. Like, he could be injured. Maybe he's just drunk, but you don't just start slapping him around. Yeah. The man demands to be taken to Las Vegas directly. No stops, please. Melvin talks his passenger through some of the financial hardships he's been through. He mentions having applied at McDonnell Douglas, Northrop, Hughes. The passenger asks, what happened at Hughes? 
and Melvin answers, they didn't want me, at which point the passenger says, well, if he'd have known, he might have done something, and then divulges that he is Howard Hughes, owner of the company that wasn't interested in hiring Melvin. Melvin tells the man that he can call himself whatever he wants, seemingly not believing that he is Howard Hughes. Hughes asks for Melvin's full name and seems embarrassed for him that his last name is Dumar, which I wonder if, like, that was part of why Jonathan Demi was like, I have to make this movie, because this guy probably call, got called dumber his whole life, and I got called dummy my whole life, hmm. so I'm going to make his movie. Uh, he, gets, he gets a little um, crazy, and I, I feel like I was watching Jason Robard's performance that he, he's playing the, as a character who's actually a little bit frightened. Because it's like you better start singing, or we're gonna, you know, you gotta sing or get out. Yeah, it's just like it's almost like he's a hostage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Melvin asks Hughes if he'll join him in a song. He says he wrote this Christmas song and he paid some place to write music to it. Hughes makes it very clear that he is not interested in music. Well, I see. I wrote this song. And no. I'll... It's a Christmas song. You like it? It's called Santa's Souped Up Sleigh. Oh God. See, what I did was I had to wrote the words and then I sent the words into Hollywood Music Company. They make the music up for you. It costs 70 bucks, but it's worth it. Here's how it goes. You want to hear it? No, I don't. Santa called his elves together to soup up his old sleigh so Rudolph and the other reindeer could rest on Christmas Day. It's got a million miles to travel and to do it in one day. And that's why Santa Claus has a souped-up Santa sleigh. Enough, sir. Come on, you haven't heard the good part yet. It's dramatic narration. It's like Red Sovine. And during a spoken word portion of this awful song, Hughes reaches for his bleeding ear and blames Melvin for the pain he's in. (laughs) Melvin tells him that he's cruel, and if he doesn't join in singing, that he can walk to Vegas so they better sing this song together. And he'll be back again next year in a souped-up Santa sleigh. Melvin asks Howard if he has a favorite song and prompts him to sing Bye Bye Blackbird. Howard is reluctant to sing, even his favorite song when prompted, but when he eventually does, he shows some emotion, like the song is resonating with his past, like it's a rosebud moment or something. Mm. Pack up all my cares and woe, here I go, singing low, Bye Bye Blackbird. After a short rain burst, they roll down the windows and take big whiffs of the post-rain greasewood and sage aromas of the desert. They pull into the Sunset Strip and Howard directs Melvin to the Sands Hotel. When they stop at the hotel, where the real-life Howard Hughes spent the last years of his life, Melvin asks if he knows somebody who works there or something, implying they won't let a guy who looks like you in here. (laughs) Before he gets out, he asks if Melvin has any money to spare, and Melvin gives him all the coins he has on him and drives away. As Howard is entering the hotel... He drops some of Melvin's coins and doesn't even bother to pick them up. Oh, see, I thought he was—I thought he was tossing them to the bum who was laying on the street. Oh, did he? I didn't even see. Uh, no, I—I I, don't—I don't know. Melvin gets home and kisses his sleeping daughter Darcy. Climbs into bed with his wife Linda. She wakes up to Melvin's truck and motorcycle being simultaneously repossessed. She wakes her daughter and packs up everything they would need to leave together. We cut to mother and daughter at a shady motel, and from outside we overhear the tail end of a fight between Linda and her new man as he gives up on them and walks out of the motel room. After what appears to have been beating right. on Dar- uh, not Darcy, but uh, Linda. Linda. Inside the room, Linda looks bruised and she's crying, and Darcy asks if they can please go home. She misses her friends and her father, and Linda decides to send Darcy home on her own and to buy everything she'll need to make a sandwich for Darcy on the bus. So this whole sequence should have been cut. Yeah. she She should have... Linda can leave and leave him and leave, drive off with a guy and the daughter can stay but to do this whole like 15 minute rigmarole of that she goes away they make a whole sandwich at a, a whole, train station yeah and then she gets back on the bus and is just right back with the father like nothing happened yeah yeah but hold on can't then the next hour of the movie also be cut <laughs> <laughs> i'm not kidding i'm like not nothing actually comes of any of this stuff for another hour yeah I feel like we could cut directly from him dropping off Howard Hughes to him finding the letter. Yeah. Right. Well, that, I mean, I guess I, I guess that's the argument to be made if you're like me and you don't like a slice of life movie because that's what 90% of this movie right. is. Um, but also, if you've read the IMDb synopsis like, and somebody tries to describe to you what this movie is about, they're going to say, well, what happens in this movie? A guy drops off Howard Hughes 
and then there's a will that yeah, you shows up that right he inherits that. something. So yeah. there's literally an hour in the movie between those two things happening. So why not cut every one of yeah. these scenes? Yeah, the act one, <laughs> act one break should have been receiving the letter. <laughs> yeah, and and people accusing him of having it be right. a forgery. I but think, I think there's a lot of interesting things that could happen in that story mm-hmm. about him trying to 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 prove that things actually happened and them trying to validate the will and all of that stuff. But we don't really get much of any of that. Because I I think what's confusing is that they try they thought that there was enough to Melvin Dumar as a character to build but, this whole movie on. But he's not the interesting person in this movie. Exactly. The 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 um. Mary Steenburgen is the interesting Yeah, I, I can't remember her name in Linda. this movie. Linda. Linda is the interesting character in this movie. Yeah. And, you know, we we do actually get quite a few scenes of her doing some things, but I wouldn't have built a movie around this guy. But I also feel like that probably is part of why she got the Best Supporting Oscar Actress is because that's really just an actress <laughs> performance. She, that's not a supporting actress. Because <laughs> she held up this whole movie. Yeah, she's yeah. the lead actress of this movie would have been much worse without her. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think that Melvin was enough of a character and I don't think that this performance is so insane that it makes sense to to rely on his life outside of the involvement of Howard Hughes right. to keep it going. Agreed. Although when she's making this sandwich, I'm totally freaking out when she's cutting the bread in half because she's oh, got God. her hands wrapped yes. around the loaf mm-hmm. as she's slicing it. Um, it's terrifying. Darcy makes it back to Melvin and she seems much happier with him. At his job, Melvin's pal, Little Red, tries to assure Melvin that Linda will come back, because they always do. Flying in the face of his own assertions, he asks if Melvin wants to leave with him to meet his sister. What's she like? All tall, thin, bluish hair. She takes toes on the Golden Gate Bridge. You like her. Yeah. You want to come, Melvin? I'll tell you what, though. I'll ride with you to Reno. How's that? because he figured out that that's where Linda is holed up. The two drive to the strip club where Linda is now employed in Reno. Uh, I, 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 this is the only part of the movie that I actually really laughed. Yeah. Because when Mary Steenburgen's up on stage and she's so into her her act. Yeah. Yes. But but then also one of the strippers comes to inform her that her husband's here and she's got a broken arm. Yeah. She's yeah. like up a in a cast. cast. <laughs> and it's like the kind where her arm is like held up. I was like, <laughs> and she still has to perform? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that was such a great little character bit. It's I feel like that actress showed up that day with a cast on. She's like, I'm really sorry. I fell out of my car or something. And they were just like, that's fine. This is a great like character moment for this other stripper. Yeah, yeah. Melvin starts shouting at her from off stage. And she says that she gets off in 10 minutes. When he climbs onto the stage to collect her, he is intercepted by the club's security. Mel goes home and back to work without her. <laughs> so this scene could easily have been one visit. Yeah. But they split it up into two where he tries to get her back and they throw him out. And then he comes back presumably weeks later. Yeah. To because, a different strip club. Right. Right. But now he she, has divorce papers with him. Yeah. Because she got fired for causing an incident. Did she? The, or they gave her a warning or something. I, I felt I felt that she got fired because she says she's saying goodbye to everybody. I thought that was the first time. The first time she just got a warning or someone said like i can't have this happening in my club and mm-hmm. then the second time she's getting fired uh-huh. i thought they were two different clubs okay maybe i'm wrong she asks what the contract says about darcy and he says he wants full custody because he doesn't work in a strip club and linda has already proven that she can't provide for the girl because she threw her on a bus to send her back to her dad immediately and quits every strip club she gets hired at. yeah come on stick <laughs> to it lady she tosses a drink at melvin in anger and the club owner gets between them to break it up after Melvin leaves, the owner tries to tell Linda that he can't put up with this in his place. And so she just tears off her stripper outfit and walks naked through the rest of the club. <laughs> Back in their trailer at home, Melvin and Darcy share a breakfast while watching a game show called Easy Street, which is a fictional combination of You Bet Your Life and The Gong Show. The contestant wins a trip to Hawaii and Darcy leaves to go play. Is the first contestant that we see just the woman that's playing an instrument or is it the two-headed guy? No, it's a woman playing an instrument. Yeah. Okay. Linda calls Melvin and asks if Darcy can come to see her. And Melvin asks if she's drunk or pregnant. And she feigns confusion, but we can see that she's seven or eight months pregnant. Melvin is guessing correctly at a lot of what's going on, despite her refusal to confirm anything. And he says, I'll tell you what, for your sake, you better hope it's a girl. What are you talking about, Melvin? You know what I'm talking about. I'm telling you that if that's a boy, and it doesn't look like me, you're in big trouble. You're both in trouble. 
He suggests Vegas as a venue for their remarriage, and she seems caught off guard by the proposal, but not against it, and agrees to the ceremony. We cut to Darcy helping to prepare her for the wedding in what looks like a gas station bathroom, probably. Yeah. How do I look? <laughs> and then she says i do don't i and and darcy can see that she's so hurt she's like but nice you look real good at the chapel melvin talks her into wearing the blue veil even though it's five bucks extra and selects the hawaiian war chant as the music for another five dollars 39 dollars total for the license and ceremony and witnesses and the extras melvin didn't realize how much witnesses cost i guess i don't know what wedding witnesses are <laughs> i would have thought that they just needed to be there but yeah. wouldn't be necessary if you had your own witnesses yeah because uh he has michael j pollard yeah, yeah and the daughter and, Dar- and Darcy. well she might not count as a witness because she might not be she legally doesn't. able to sign mm. a contract but they still stage this older couple in the room and they have to pay them a rate for being right. there but i also like this bit <laughs> but that's the other thing i don't get because i've never been to a wedding where the witnesses have to go up and kiss the people that just got married <laughs> yeah this whole scene was just it, it was unnecessary and super icky. Yeah. But for whatever reason, after this ceremony, Linda has to kiss the old man witness. And she kisses him so hard on the mouth that he has some sort of an attack and has to leave. Mm-hmm. And then when Melvin hears the woman running the place worried that the witnesses are leaving and they have three more ceremonies today, he offers up himself and Linda and Little Red as witnesses so that they can make back the money they just spent on their right. I, I kind of I kind of like that bit, but in this day and age of coronavirus, like yeah, seeing everyone really kissing all these strangers, I was just like, ugh. Uh, as a result, they all make out intensely with both members of the next three wedding ceremonies. Linda, Darcy, and Melvin gamble the night away at the adjacent casino, and we cut to Glendale, California, as milkmen load up at a dairy, Melvin works here now, and he checks in with a woman at the counter, Bonnie, to report his deliveries and tells her he's going to win Milkman of the Month. Well, you're in the lead, Melvin. You want to know something? I'm for you. Melvin is called into an office to learn that an engine on the milk truck that blew his first week on the job, through no fault of his own, is going to be deducted from his pay. The contest he wanted to win goes by net pay, so this deduction would put a dent in that. Melvin grabs his boss by the collar, pissed about what's being done to him and eventually the guy just awards him milkman of the month right there along with the zenith tv prize for whoever wins but it's still going to take the deduction right we cut to a baby being handed to linda at a hospital and they have a son now we cut to the two-headed guy from the gong show dancing around on easy street on television Uh, i guess this is the new tv we're looking at now yeah um but we did see this guy in the gong show movie earlier this year or these guys i should say it's not an actual two-headed person (laughs) (laughs) Linda, Darcy, the baby, and Grandma are all watching the show, and Linda seems upset. She's sipping on brandy and relays that the car has been repossessed yet again when Melvin gets home from work. He sees the person on TV win a $12,000 prize and gets an idea, and suddenly we cut to the studio lot where he and Linda are walking to a soundstage where they shoot Easy Street. When the show starts, Linda is called upon almost immediately, and she seems very nervous about it. The host gets weirdly sexual with his humor, even for 1980. Little candy box hat and everything. Your hands are cold. You want to put them in Uncle Wally's pocket? (laughs) No, smarter than Uncle Wally, aren't you? After introducing herself, she gets started with a tap dance routine. She's heckled by a guy at the start, but soon turns the crowd around. But but she's not, like, good. No. No. I don't think that's supposed to be the point. (laughs) But uh, she wins a check for $500 and has the option to bet the money on one of three gates. We've established this far in the movie from the the viewing of the woman playing the instrument the first time and the two-headed guy dancing the second time that melvin always knows which gate is going to open yeah and so he says gate three in front of the audience and she picks two which is not what he said but she wins a living room set which she and melvin both seem happy about like maybe there's only one prize yeah and and it it retailed for a thousand dollars so they're like oh we'll be able to sell it and that's more than the check she was going to get for 500 if she didn't open a gate right that makes sense When suddenly a rumbling sound indicates an additional prize and a piano rolls on stage, but that's not all. A neon sign lowers down from the ceiling to notify her that on top of all this, she also won $10,000 cash. We cut right from the game show to a real estate office where Melvin and Linda are buying a house. Melvin tries to talk her out of buying the cheaper of the two models, and we cut directly to them at the new home. Linda is telling Darcy which of her wish list items they can afford when Melvin shows up with a brand new car and boat that he just bought. She slams the door in his face, and a few hours later, she is all packed to leave with the kids. Justifiable. Yes. Because this is going to be impossible to live with this person if he's just blowing through all the money that they just won. 
Darcy tosses her brother into a taxi in a rolling play chair. Like it's like a baby walker. Yeah. And she puts it just on the floor of the taxi in the back seat. And before they go, Darcy asks her dad. Will I see you again? <laughs> of course you will. But he thinks that she's being unreasonable leaving. And he claims that the car and boat are both investments, even though vehicles are famous for losing value the second you get them off the lot. He watches his family leave in a taxi and for some reason gets to keep the house that Linda paid the down payment on. Probably that night, but maybe a week later, Melvin is delivering milk when a housewife invites him in out of the cold for a nice hot cup of cocoa. And when he leaves, he's straightening out his pants. Back at the dairy, Melvin's boss is telling him how much money he owes the company and that it will all be coming out of his paycheck with interest. $90 a week interest, to be exact. So now Melvin is paying them for the honor of working there. You move 15 tons, what do you get? <laughs> this is worse than that, though. This, this isn't like you earn money and then you spend it on things that we sell to you. It's like, oh, you broke a thing that is just a part of what we're supposed mm-hmm. to upkeep. And then, like, they're charging him for his uniform. They're charging him for all this other stuff. And yeah. it's like, I didn't want this stuff. I have to have it for the job. The boss advises him to sell the boat or Cadillac, but he already did. Well, he sold the boat. The car was yeah. repossessed. Yeah, that's right. Uh, later, at a Christmas party for the office, Melvin is pestered on stage to sing his terrible music. Bonnie from the office loves it and hugs him as he comes off stage. Now, was this just Hawaiian themed or did they go to Hawaii for their Christmas party? I think it's just Hawaiian themed. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it, but it's also, I don't get like the relationship between him and his boss because this almost seemed like a little bit friendly adversarial yeah. versus the adversarial adversarial that yeah. it was. And and when he gets up and sings, everyone is happy that he's singing. But once again, yeah. he's not good at it. No, but I think everyone's just... Well, yeah, you cheer on somebody at an office party if they're singing, whether or not they're good. It, it seems like... Yeah. I can't... I, I could... I, we don't see enough of his relationships with other people to know if they're making fun of him or if they actually are genuinely going like, yeah, this is fun. Well, I think for sure here, Bonnie is completely in love with him. So she right. thinks his singing is great. And the two of them kiss near a volcano decoration when Bonnie says hey, we're going to move to Willard, Utah and run a gas station and get married. (laughs) And then we cut to them already settled in at the gas station and Bonnie has the two kids from her earlier marriage. They're not managing the place very well and they can't even write a check for the gas that they intend to sell. Suddenly on TV, a news story announces the death of Howard Hughes. Melvin reminds them of the story he's told about picking up Hughes. A man in a three-piece suit walks in looking for cigarettes and a light. Melvin steps out of the gas station to help a customer and the man leaves an envelope on Melvin's desk. As he leaves, he tosses the box of cigarettes he was actually here to buy out of the car on the ground. So this whole business really bothers me because I feel like, again, one of the more interesting parts of the story is that we don't really know what happened, right? Right. There's mystery involved into who made this will, how did it get where it got to? And so if you take that mystery out and you kind of put this in here and say, hey, a guy dropped this off, which is what he says happened. Right. But mm-hmm. if we see it happen, then we're like, oh, he's he's honest. He's telling the truth. This right. is like a legit thing that happened. So we've taken out the mystery and we've taken out any guessing. I think that Demi wanted us to presuppose that he was telling the truth. And the only way that we would think that because we've seen this guy be shitty in the past is if we actually saw it happening. And so this movie is just a, here's here's you watching it and you see that it actually did happen and imagine how frustrated you would be if you went through what he did after that. I guess, but I think that's that's sort of rewriting history a little bit. like Unless that's how it went. Unless that's how it went. But I think by taking by taking out the mystery and not letting people decide for themselves by showing them what you think that, you know, actually happened is, is trying to write history again. I think, and Melvin Dumar is not the only person who said, I found a will from Howard Hughes and he gave me this many millions of dollars. He's just the most famous account of it. And I think that he got a lot of shit from people for the whole rest of his life for making this up. And so Jonathan Demi wanted to just be like, Here's a story about a guy who did exactly what happened, and this is all real, and now you can't hate him for just trying to get the money that he was actually given by this man. Like, I I think it's definitely a choice that they don't leave it up to interpretation, that it's like, no, 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 this actually happened. Now do you hate him? Now is he an asshole? It's like, yes, he's still an asshole because of terrible things that he did in his life. But Uh, This movie is very similar to another movie that came out uh, maybe – got 10 15 years ago now called the hoax with richard gear and alfred molina 
uh, where Howard Hughes was still alive, uh, and uh, this failed writer claimed that he got the exclusive rights to write Howard Hughes's biography, which no one had. Oh, okay. And he starts faking interviews and tape recordings and and uh, things like that to show that Howard Hughes is funding him writing his autobiography and goes through all these hoops and things like that. Yeah. Gets convinces all these people he's got a partner who's with him who's kind of going crazy because he thinks they're going to get caught. Is this uh, based on a real story? Based or? on a real story. Oh, interesting. Um, but they intermix it with people from Hughes, Hughes's company coming in and assaulting him and having him do like small errands in, in exchange for allowing him to continue to fake this autobiography. Okay. And so I think that's like the Hollywood fiction. Yeah. Is that this guy was claiming, no, no, I did really fake this biography, but because Howard Hughes was making me fake it. Like, yeah. Like trying to spin it a different way. <laughs> Interesting. Melvin reads this letter and he runs to his car and then drives to the headquarters of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and stashes it in a big box of mail in some random office in the building. I, I had no idea what was going on here. Yeah, it's it very was, strange. It was very weird. I mean, I know when you were telling the the, his, the true history of the story, you said that they found a will at the Church of Latter-day Saints. Yes, but I he admitted to planting it there. But but to what end? To Why would Howard Hughes send a will to this location and rather than with his lawyers or i mean well but again, i think the the implication being that the lawyers didn't care what his what his wishes were they just wanted to take his money mm. bonnie receives a call on the phone letting her know that a will for howard hughes has been discovered and that he left one sixteenth of his fortune to melvin so they found this letter that melvin planted at the church and then somehow the church got it to the news and the news reported on this the gas station is quickly overflowing with journalists and the house is overflowing with friends and family. It's just a bunch of random people are hanging around because they think he's going to be a millionaire soon. One guy, apparently Melvin's agent now, tells him that they want him for the talk shows and press conferences. And during a press conference, Melvin is peppered with questions, apparently improvised on set, and Melvin is having to answer off the top of his head. So they didn't give the journalists questions. They just said, what would you ask if you were in this situation? And so he was having to just answer off the top of his head there. One of the last questions, though, is... But, uh, Melvin, everybody in this country thinks you're lying. How does that make you feel? <laughs> we understand. During the news broadcast, they interview his boss from the Rockwood Dairy, who wants to remind him on television that he owes them $4,500. <laughs> I, I sure hope that when he gets it, though, that he remembers he owes uh, the Rockwood Dairy here's uh, $4,500. So that's like a whole new milk truck. That's not even just an engine. Melvin helps a customer at the pump, and then the driver tells him, You remember me, don't you, Melvin? Uh, I was with you. Huh? We were all together. You, me, and Howard. And then he pulls out a gun, and he says, He's the one who gave Hughes the quarters as he got out of the car. Melvin moves quickly to wrestle the gun away from the guy, which is then fired through the roof of the car a few times. Bonnie's daughter hears it and screams, and another employee at the gas station helps to grapple the shooter and they pin him down while Bonnie calls the police. While they load the guy into the police car, he shouts about how Melvin's a liar and a nobody. A phone rings in Garden Grove, California. Melvin's calling Linda to check up on her and the kids, possibly having just realized that they may be in danger also. Everyone's okay, and they're all amazed by the story. We cut to the Clark County Courthouse in Las Vegas, Nevada. Melvin's giving his testimony in court as to why he brought the will to the church and why Hughes left it for him in the first place. But all of his answers are just, I don't know. I don't yeah. know why I did that. I don't know why he did that. And it's very unsatisfying. You know, you're you're just you're clicking some things in my head here. That uh, this you said this is the court in Nevada. Yes. And now I'm really confused because the judge calls him brother. He, he calls him brother Dumar, and I was like, oh, so we must be still be in Utah. I don't know. Because. I, I just thought it was I – th I thought maybe that was like a Mormon expression. Hmm. And hmm. and so I, uh, now like I'm really confused as to, that, as to that line. I didn't catch that line. But since it's just Melvin's word against everyone here, they are just – basically the court boils down to them asking him over and over again, do you swear? Do you swear on a Bible? What if you go to hell? Is it still true? Melvin, are you lying? It's just over and over again like, did you make this up? Because And, and again, like to me, that's why I thought this was Utah. Like, yeah. Them really like saying – this is the Bible now. Yeah. yeah. Like you, you can't not 
be correct. And the judge basically says, you know, some people have magical powers and they can tell when other people are lying. And I have those powers and I think you're lying. And he threatens Melvin with criminal prosecution if he can prove that Melvin's lying. And he will recommend prison time if it comes to that. Melvin sticks to his story, though, through all the repetitive questioning. And when the court takes a recess, his attorneys are still convinced that he's going to get this inheritance for some reason. The attorneys tell him that he can't get disheartened now because he should know this isn't the end of the fight. They will appeal over and over, and Melvin's lawyers will only get more and more expensive. And Melvin says, oh, don't worry about it. I never had any illusions that I would get this money. He doesn't even seem to care about the money and is content with the memory that Howard Hughes sang his shitty Christmas song in the car that night. Melvin meets Linda to take the kids for the summer, and they kiss before parting. As if it wasn't disturbing enough to see the kids loaded into a taxi in a baby walker earlier, now Melvin's son Farron is allowed to fall completely asleep in the front seat of the car and then be handed sleeping over the seats into the back seat while driving at full speed. Mm -hmm. We flash back to a new moment with Howard in the car. Howard offers to drive, and Melvin is hesitant but gives in. Melvin falls asleep in the passenger seat, and Howard resumes singing Bye Bye Blackbird while excitedly drumming on the wheel. Back up all my cares and woe, here I go singing low, bye bye Blackbird. The end title tells us, Howard Hughes died in April of 1976. The Mormon will was thrown out of Clark County Superior Court in June of 1978. Linda is a housewife and lives with her husband Bob in Garden Grove, California. Melvin and Bonnie live in Willard, Utah, where Melvin drives a delivery truck for Coors Beer. A will acceptable to the courts has yet to be found. And that's the end of our film. Yeah. It was directed by Jonathan Demme, who did Silence of the Lambs, Philadelphia, Rachel Getting Married, The Manchurian Candidate remake. Big movies that are inarguably interesting and have Mm -hmm. a lot of plot to them. Uh, His first film was a women in prison film Caged Heat, which he wrote and directed. Writer Bo Goldman won the Oscar for this and put it on the shelf with his Oscar for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He was also nominated for Scent of a Woman, and he also wrote Meet Joe Black. All fine stories. Yes, (laughs) yes. Producer Art Linson directed Where the Buffalo Roam earlier this year. Cinematographer Tak Fujimoto. Yeah. He was the cinematographer for Buffalo Roam. He was a DP on Star Wars, Silence of the Lambs, The MacGyver Pilot, Sixth Sense, Devil, That Thing You Do, Gladiator, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Pretty in Pink, Death Race 2000. He'll be back later this year for Borderline. Jason Robards was Howard Hughes. So far we've discussed his work in Raise the Titanic in 1980 and The Ballad of Cable Hogue in 1970. He's in A Thousand Clowns. Once Upon a Time in the West, A Boy and His Dog, All the President's Men, Julia, Parenthood, Quick Change, Philadelphia, and Magnolia, and other things. Paul Lamatt was Melvin Dumar. He plays John Milner in American Graffiti's 1 and 2. He's Alex Whitaker in Puppet Master, and he's Josiah Peel in Lonesome Dove. Mary Steenburgen is Linda Dumar. Her first film was Going South in 78 with Jack Nicholson. Yeah. She reunited with Robards for Parenthood. She was Clara Clayton in Back to the Future 3. She was married to Malcolm McDowell at the time of this film. Mm -hmm. And And she she never ages. Nope, she looks (laughs) the exact same. Oh, my God. I was watching, like, she's in the last season of Justified. Yeah. And and I was like, she looks exactly like she looked in 1980, even today. It's pretty crazy. Uh, She was back with Demi for Philadelphia. She plays the mom in Elf and the mom in Step Brothers and the stepmom in Step Brothers. (laughs) One of her greatest lines. Yeah. <laughs> what the fucking fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I love when Richard Jenkins goes crazy and he's like, I am a medical doctor. I'm a medical doctor. <laughs> he's like slapping his hand on the car as he's freaking out. <laughs> um, she also played Diana Jessup, the mother-in-law of Jack Donaghy on 30 Rock. Chip Taylor played Clark Taylor. This is a character that we only barely see that's the guy who smacks her around in the motel okay but we don't actually see his face we don't even see his face you just see a guy in a cowboy hat walk back out to his truck and leave yeah and he is the brother of john voight uncle of angelina jolie and he has a lot of soundtrack credits because he's the composer and performer of wild thing you make my heart sing that was him melvin e dumar played the bus depot counterman that's the guy that the movie is about i don't remember the character uh the bus depot oh um, probably the guy who is keep getting them, gives them, giving them stuff to make the sandwich. Sandwiches. Okay. Michael J. Pollard played Little Red. He's Herman and Scrooged. 
He's Owen and Tango and Cash, C.W. Moss and Bonnie and Clyde, and he's Andy and Roxanne. Denise Galick, Denise Galick played Lucy. She was Lisa in Don't Answer the Phone and Linda Beale in Humanoids from the Deep already this year. She'll be back for Oh God Book 2 later. Gloria Graham played Mrs. Sisk. She's Violet in It's a Wonderful Life. She's Debbie Marsh in The Big Heat. And she's Laurel Gray in In a Lonely Place. Robert Ridgely played Wally Mr. Love Williams. That's the host of Easy Street. He played Walter Kenton in Demi's Philadelphia. He was Mayor Egan in Beverly Hills Cop 2. He played the Hangman in Robin Hood Men in Tights. And he also worked with Paul Thomas Anderson on Boogie Nights as the Colonel, which is a super dark character who finishes the movie in prison, if you remember who the Colonel is. Uh, Susan Peretz played the chapel owner. She was Angie in Dog Day Afternoon. She's Louise in Oh God, You Devil. And she plays a daughter in Poltergeist 2. Charles Napier's Ventura, that's the guy who leaves the letter on his desk. He played Tucker McElroy in Blues Brothers earlier this year, the the lead singer of the good old boys. The good old boys. Uh, Commander Gilmore in Austin Powers, Lieutenant Gilmore in Demi's Silence of the Lambs, and Murdoch in Rambo Second Blood. Uh, I he's and he's just got such a fantastic voice. He does a lot of uh, cartoons. He was Jay Sherman's boss on The Critic. Right. Jack Kehoe was Jim Delgado. He plays Eerie Kid in The Sting. He's Tom Keo in Serpico, and he's Jerry Geisler in Midnight Run. I think that's uh, I think that character is hanging out with Joey Pants in yeah. Joey Pants's office. He keeps going out to. That's right, because he's the boss. Yeah, but he but he is informing to the mob of the location of Charles Grodin's character. Right. Pamela Reed was Bonnie Demar. She's Phoebe in Kindergarten Cop. She's Trudy Cooper in The Right Stuff, and she made her feature film debut earlier this year as Belle Star in The Long Riders. Sonny Carl Davis was Milkman George. We had him earlier this year as Stepanian in Where the Buffalo Roam and Bird in Roadie. That's the guy who goes, women! <laughs> <laughs> and who shows up at uh, Lola's, yeah, or at, at the sister's wedding yeah. without having been invited. He was just like, oh, I heard there was a party. <laughs> Danny Dark played the Easy Street announcer. He's the voice of Superman in a bunch of animated series. Not my favorite animated Superman voice, though. <laughs> you talking about Tim Daly? Nope. Oh. Our good friend. Oh. <laughs> Jason Lewis is the best Superman of all time. Martine Beswick played the realty agent. She was Paula in Thunderball and Zora in From Russia with Love. She's Angela in Critters 4. And she was Happy Hooker Xaviera Hollander earlier this year in Happy Hooker Goes Hollywood. I, you know, I... I couldn't I couldn't place it, and I looked her up, but I just kind of scanned through some of the things at the top of the list, and yeah. it's like, eh, I don't know. Anything. That was her. She came back, and she sold him a house. Gary Goatsman was Melvin's cousin Fred. Getsman. Goatsman. Getsman. You're allowed to say it however you want, he said. Oh, really? No, that's not true. Okay. Uh, Gary Getsman played Melvin's cousin Fred. When do we even see his cousin? Uh, I am, I think that this is the one one of his attorneys- the one with the beard who keeps coming well, There's in. a first attorney and second attorney credit. Oh. Oh, Is it maybe. the guy at the gas station that helps attack Oh, the, maybe the guy that's got the gun? Anyway, Getzman is a film producer. He produced Mamma Mia, My Big Fat Wedding, Polar Express, and Where the Wild Things Are, in addition to including our second Wild Thing reference. These are all co-produced by Tom Hanks. Yeah, play, he works for Playtime. Yeah. It's a pattern that follows Getzman's entire IMDb page. It's all Tom Hanks movies and Tom Hanks produced movies. I wonder if Richard has met this guy because he was a producer on <laughs> Hologram for the King. I <laughs> uh, didn't want to like lead into that. Uh, no, I've I've never I've never met him. I may have been on a conference call with him once or twice. Yeah, but uh, that, that's you know that's there you go. That, that's it. That's my only connection. <laughs> that's as much as I'm going to say <laughs> legally. Rob Reese was Linda's husband. I think we see the back of his head when they're in bed. Uh, he played Callow, one of the Malmori in Battle Beyond the Stars. That's all I have for him. Joseph Ragno was the first attorney. Uh, Maxwell is the attorney's name. And this is these are the, the double team prosecuting attorneys that are peppering him with questions in court. Right, right. And Ragno was also the prosecuting attorney in Where the Buffalo Roam, who is getting the kid thrown in jail and He's one like he like he hands him like the ice cream or the right. the sandwich or something. Yeah, he gives him a sandwich this. before court starts. Um, he played Ray Zefno in The Phantom. He was Ernie in Shawshank Redemption. 
And he was also a member of the president's cabinet in the kidnapping of the president. He's the one who says to the vice president, well, you always said that we should just murder the president in this situation. Mm. He's like, you're right. I am on the record as having said that. John Glover played the other attorney. He was Nathan Wyeth earlier this year in The Mountain Man. He's Daniel Clamp in Gremlins 2. He's a Magnavolt salesman in RoboCop 2. <laughs> he's Bryce Cummings in Scrooge, Saperstein in In the Mouth of Madness. And he's Dr. Jason Woodrow in Batman and Robin, who creates Bane. <laughs> created Bane in the laboratory. He's also Lex Luthor's father on Smallville and Dr. Savannah's dad in Shazam. Dabney Coleman was Judge Keith Hayes. He was McKittrick in War Games and Bill Ray in On Golden Pond. He's in Cloak and Dagger. We've had him for Nothing Personal and How to Beat the High Cost of Living this year. This will be his first non-American international release for the year, but he'll be back as Franklin Hart Jr. in 9 to 5. Probably one of his more famous roles. Yes. Howard Hughes played himself in archival footage on the television when uh, we see about his death. He directed Hell's Angels and The Outlaw. He produced the original Scarface and Sky Devils and a bunch of stuff. Joe Spinell was Go-Go Club owner number two. This is the guy who fires him or who fires Linda as her husband is presenting the divorce paperwork. We've had him already this year in Cruising, Forbidden Zone, The Ninth Configuration, The Little Dragons, and Brubaker. But that confirms that it's two different clubs. I guess, yeah. Club owner two. Yeah, that does make sense. And he'll be back for First Deadly Sin later this year. Tom Willett played the kissing cowboy what does that mean who's the kissing cowboy <laughs> is that not the one who was in her room with her because you said that was somebody else yeah it was so i don't know oh maybe uh at the weddings the excessive mm. kissing at the wedding oh maybe that's what it is um tom willett was in 90 episodes of dear john he played abe lincoln on the drew carey show and in kiss kiss bang bang that's all the credits i had for this one um, I think we've basically gone over our problems, which is that the guy didn't have an interesting enough life to warrant the movie being about his life and not this thing that happened to him. Yeah, I'm also just bothered by the, you know, taking liberties on, you know, the story that it's not necessarily how it actually went and, and yeah. not really. Well, you don't know that. <laughs> I, yeah, I, 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 I think that another way of handling it would have been for him to because we because we know that he falls asleep with howard driving that howard wrote and just left it in his glove compartment yeah i think that would have been a more interesting thing that he goes into a clear like if it's and we know his his truck gets repossessed but maybe he goes out and clears it out or something like that and he finds a handwritten letter and he scoffs at it until howard hughes dies and then that's when he gets the idea that maybe this is real and i should open it and see what's inside and try to sneak it in to me that's a more that one stays true to his version but also kind of manifests where this fake will came from right rather than have a guy in black in a limousine right. but drop it off what you're saying is that our lead character here should have made up a better story uh, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty clear which side of the of history jesse's coming down on no, she thinks this I, guy made it up she's 100 percent dead set on that and it bothers her that the movie presupposes that he didn't make it up well I, it bothers me that we don't leave it open to interpretation i think it would have been a more interesting movie if we left some mystery in there and you get to decide like i think if we didn't see him finding the letter in his office and see the guy leaving it that i would 100 percent be absolutely certain that he made it up well, but maybe we make him look like a better person and maybe we develop the well, story. Then you're, then you're just changing different facts in the movie. No, I'm just saying that you, we don't know what happened on that ride with Howard Hughes. And so yeah. if you're going to make stuff up, make that a more interesting time. Like have them have more of a connection and, and have it go a little bit deeper. And then you're thinking, well, maybe, maybe it really did happen that way. And maybe he did write him into the will. But like... If you're going to mess with stuff, mess with like, well, this thing did happen, but I, you know. I, I did think it was weird when we were 20 minutes into the movie and we were still in the car. And I was like, is this whole movie just them talking in the car? Because I actually think I would have preferred that. I would have liked that if better they'd, too. If they'd been in the car or at least on the road trip to Las Vegas the entire time and just been talking about their lives. And then we end with the courtroom drama. Yeah. Like we just cut right through. That would have been an interesting yeah. movie. I'm not sure what the middle of this movie was meant to do. I mean, I'm glad that 
Mary Steenburgen has an Oscar because I love her and oh, she yeah. deserves one. She's great. But uh, that part of the story wasn't enough for a movie. Um, yeah. yeah. But it was also just a weird mix, you know? Like, it, I don't think this movie knew what it wanted to be. It wasn't, it wasn't just a story of this guy's life. They tried to make it like the story. They tried. They tried to give it, you know, something grand to happen. It's like, oh, there's this will and all this stuff. But you know, ninety percent of the movie has nothing to do with that. Yeah, I, I feel like there were people sitting around tables during the development of this film, going, "Well, this guy Dumari, he's such a fascinating character," and it's like, no, he's not. He just he just goes with the flow. Mm-hmm. He's a very simple guy. He does what people tell him to do. He doesn't know. He's not good with money. Yeah. So even like even if he was awarded the money, yeah. as he like, would well, have that died money, broke that, money, that money's way. gone in a yeah. year. Yeah. Um, and I think another weird thing is that they bring up that th- that handwriting experts experts approved the handwritten note. Like they they said mm-hmm. that yeah, this this was written by Howard Hughes. To me, that's like a. To me, that's a clinching, like a, like like hard evidence, like that if if a handwriting expert compares and, so, and I mean obviously I guess it's an opinion, but to look at this guy and to say this guy was able to forge Howard Hughes's handwriting. Well, I think the implication is actually that the church did all the research to forge it, and they were like, "Hey, we want to use your story. You tell people all the time about this story with Howard Hughes, and." We want to use your story to help the church and to help you. So we're going to make a fake will with we we have we can pay researchers mm-hmm. to figure out who might be on his staff that yeah. would be the executor of this will, and we'll put the whole thing together. And all you have to do is say that you brought it to us when you found it. Yeah, I mean that that's sort of the stuff that was bothering me about it. I'm like, back in you know the day, it's how would he know any of this stuff about Howard Hughes? And I think that that would be why people would say it would be an argument to say that he didn't write it but he had to be involved in this right but he wasn't i mean howard hughes wasn't mormon so it doesn't make sense that he would leave a 16th of his money to the mormon church right who just has out the, of nowhere right who has the resources to figure out these things to put in this will. right i also think if this ventura character the guy who left the will in his office existed that in the interest of seeing through the task that you were put forth with yes. you should appear publicly and Mm -hmm. say yes i worked for howard hughes and i delivered that will because if you're watching on tv this guy getting dragged through the ringer and the court ultimately deciding against him that this is not true then do you you just not care that he doesn't get the money well again unless this is an agent of the church who was doing this throwing this will down into his lap to see how would they know that he would turn around and bring it to the church that's true um, but it also just makes no sense because that's not what you would do with a will. You wouldn't take a will that someone hand wrote and just drop it off somewhere. Se- secretly with one of the people that was in it. Yeah. yeah. It, yes, just one randomly. Right. Like, I feel like if you're going to drop it off anywhere, you would drop it off at the church first. Right. Or at a lawyer's office or right. something. You, you, if you, what I suspect they are saying this guy is, is an employee or a former employee of Howard Hughes, why would he not want his boss's will to be executed the way his boss wanted it to be? And if he didn't want that, then why would he deliver the will at all? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So it just it, it makes but no by, sense. by giving it to Melvin, you're actually convoluting it because yeah. you should have just given it straight to the church. And then when Melvin's name shows up in it, he looks even more innocent. Yeah. But if you force him to bring it back to the church then it's like oh this letter magically appeared at your house and you brought it here to us and mm-hmm. it says that you get 150 some million dollars yeah so i'm right <laughs> i didn't say you weren't right i'm <laughs> saying that you're judging the movie for changing facts and you don't know the facts nobody knows the facts no i i'm judging the movie for taking a side okay so i think that I don't, I'm not saying that it has to take my side. They could have formulated this movie in a way that it it left it open to interpretation, which I think would have been a more interesting movie. I actually think that this approach would be more interesting, taking the side that it was authentic. Because if you if you take the other side, then there's not much more to the movie than there is to the article about what happened. Yeah. 
where you're just like, okay, I have to decide and I don't really know. Well, then I don't know if this guy's a good guy or a bad guy and I don't know what to think about him. Yeah, that's because we spent 90% of the movie on him and his family when we should have spent more time either in the car the whole time or yeah. more time on the proceedings as to figuring out what the hell this letter is. Yep. Up or down, Jess? I'm going to give it a down. I am too. I, I'm not a big fan. Yeah. And it's sad because <laughs> as you both gaze over to Richard, <laughs> Richard. Well, no, I yeah, I'm 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 giving it a down. Um, I agree with both sides of your arguments as far as like that. Both of you have different opinions, but both of you agree this could have been a better movie. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so that's where I am at. Well, this could have been a more interesting movie in any way, uh, but uh, I didn't feel. I I felt it was. I, I felt it should have been a truly fictional account. Like yeah. not, not try to base it on a real person, not, not try to follow with his name and his family life. Yeah. Create a person who was with Howard and then is trying to convince the world that that, yeah. that happened. Yeah. It, yeah. Which, which is the exact plot of, Oh God. Like the first one. Yeah. The, the first plot is that he meets God. No one believes him. He has to prove it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was super also disappointed because the cover art, like the DVD cover art of this is, uh, you know, Melvin and his wife, like, you know, hugging and Howard Hughes looking like super cool on his motorcycle in front of them. I thought we were going to get some sort of like, you know, romantic comedy in the vein of IQ, you know, like we have this eccentric <laughs> old man who's helping yeah. this lovely budding relationship or or whatever. I would love that movie. I know. That's, <laughs> I was super excited. I'm like, it's going to be a comedy. It's going to be a, a romantic comedy. And Jason Robards is going to just be charming and funny and got none of that. <laughs> yeah. What do you think would be a more compelling movie? If you made the OJ Simpson story. And you left it up to interpretation. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't kill him. I can't tell from the movie. I can only suspect based on the facts that we know. Or if you made a movie where conclusively he didn't do it. And it was the Yakuza or whatever the hell he thinks it was. Like, <laughs> I, forget, I forget what his story was. It, it was like it was like the Cuban mafia or some shit. Well, I think they were Asian. <laughs> I mean, I think that that would be kind of a, an amusing thing. Great? But as the filmmaker, you have to be going into that knowing you're making a false story. Yeah, I think you would. But I don't think that that is the opinion of these filmmakers. You think Demi believes him? Yes. I don't think you made a movie like this if you didn't. I think that you make the movie because you don't, because you're just like, well, you don't know. What if he What if he did get the money? Wouldn't you feel like an asshole then? Here, I'll show you what it looks like if he did get the money. Now you're going to feel like a jerk at the end of it. I don't know. I don't think I don't think that they made a compelling enough argument for it being the reverse. That's true. That's true. If that's true. If that's what even the goal even was. if he wasn't a participant in the conspiracy, it's still possible that that Ventura character is just an employee of the church and came and brought the will because he wanted to be disconnected from its origin. Yeah. Because if it just turned up at the church, then it would be obvious that the church is just trying to take right. Them. Yeah. So still, then the movie's not deciding for you. So are you pleased? No. <laughs> Why not? The movie's just showing exactly what really happened. Meh. Letterbox, where's this going, Jess? It's pretty low. I was not into it. It's a combination of a lot of things I'm not a big fan of. Um, it is 87th on my list. <laughs> just above Happy Hooker and just below The Exterminator. You got Martine Beswick in a row there. Xaviera. Well, I, I have this significantly higher. Uh, I, I have this at number 69. Uh, Ooh. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it it comes just below a movie that I feel is a little similar, Honeysuckle Rose, where it's just like, I'm not interested in this guy. <laughs> Wait, where? It, it, it's just below Honeysuckle Rose. I am just below Honeysuckle Rose also. I, and I literally had it just below Honeysuckle Rose up until a moment ago, and I was like, but... I think I'd rather watch people be put into a meat grinder than this movie again. I'm just going to throw it below the exterminator. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I have it just below Honeysuckle Rose and just above How to Beat the High Cost of Living. I think we all agree that this movie is slightly worse than Honeysuckle Rose. Yeah. I have it in 83rd 
but it's directly below Honeysuckle Rose and directly above the Little Dragons. Yeah. See, you have a similar opinion of this. Yeah. I'm only 10 off from you guys. Yeah, I but mean, I, my out of 100. it's just a couple above Little Dragons for me. It's right below Honeysuckle Rose. It's yeah. right in there. All right. Well, I think that's everything for this one. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show, and if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through Patreon.com slash Vintage Video Podcast. And on that note, I'd like to give a shout out to the Talking Back podcast for their iTunes review. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Mother's Day, which is just a holiday. Call your moms. No, it's a movie, uh, which IMDb describes like so. Two brothers kidnap and brutalize three women for the pleasure of their demented mother. It's like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but for mommy instead of grandpa. Yeah, Richard is not going to enjoy this. He's going to love no (laughs) we leave you now with the trailer for mother's day somewhere in the woods of deep barren a woman and her sons live in isolation when they come out it's for one reason only now let's see what you brought mother some say she spoiled her boys some say she drove them mad no one who found out has lived to tell Darlings, you have made your mother very proud. Charles Kaufman's Mother's Day. (laughs) Jackie, Abby, and Trina have come to the wilderness for a weekend of fun. Little do they know that out there something lies watching, waiting. Someone's coming. They're getting closer. (laughs) There's nowhere to run. No one to hear you scream. (laughs) When you know how to celebrate, every day is Mother's Day. From the darkest corner of the imagination to the outermost reaches of insanity and terror comes a celebration of mayhem. Charles Kaufman's Mother's Day. No one can escape on Mother's Day because Mother's Day never ends.